Right. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And I also welcome people uh, who are going to listen to this recording in the future. So this is uh, a session in the Jamboree, and it is titled Business Unusual, the first seven years of experiment called Britain. Um, before we dive into the housekeeping instructions and the actual interview style conversations, uh, I would invite Fran for a simple introduction, quite briefly. I would also introduce myself and then we will go into, into the session. Yeah, Fran, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Ashish. So yeah, I guess briefly, who am I before talking about greater than? Um, I'm joining you today from Barcelona, where I live a little bit north uh, outside the city uh, with my partner and my 17-month-old daughter. Um, and yeah, I, I'm what one calls a third culture kid. So I actually, uh, I grew up in an American family uh, in Germany. And then <clears throat> sort of life led me to living in uh, a couple of different countries over the years, uh, including Paris and, and then Barcelona. Um, but yeah, I think uh, a really useful thing to know about myself is that uh, I've always sort of navigated in between spaces and uh, really like uh, the places where different things uh, interconnect and, and overlap. And um, yeah, really enjoy translating and weaving across different types of spaces that, that don't always connect. So yeah, that's something that I've, I've sort of been doing my whole life. Um, especially with most of my family in the U.S. and me being in Europe and sort of always going back and forth between those two realities uh, as I was young. And uh, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that just to know a little bit about myself and I guess then passing to Ashish to hear a little bit about who you are. Thank you, Fran. So my name is Ashish. Um, I live in the northern Himalayas of India. I've been living uh, in the countryside in a rural community for the past uh, decade now, uh, along with my partner, her name is Divya. And uh, we both actually came here to work with local community kids in the field of education. And um, our intention was not to really do big, big stuff, but to actually do small things with love, whatever possible we could do uh, within our capacity. Over time, uh, I have seen myself moving from education to systems thinking, social economic system design, and now I find myself interested in um, organization, culture, transformation. And that is the pursuit which actually brought me to greater than two years back. One of the reasons for me to invite Fran for this conversation has been to understand deeply into what business unusual actually means for greater than. Even though I've been a part of greater than for the past two years, I would actually position myself for this conversation as an outsider so that I, I can ask provocative questions and, um, and also be like a little bit critical if I have to be. Uh, and how does that relate to my introduction? Actually, I come from a business family. Um, I'm a Punjabi and I have a big joint family and all of my siblings and my uncles and my father, they are into business. I'm the only odd one out. So um, I have seen business usual really closely, like since my childhood. And, and when I noticed the word business being used in the, in the conversations in greater than, that kind of intrigues me and that that is something which makes me curious to dive deeper into this conversation. So yeah, that's a little bit about me. I leave it here. And um, before we dive into the question, I would like to share a few uh, things. And the first is the design of this session. We will be um, in an interview style conversation for about um, 30, 35 minutes. For that, uh, I and Fran would be on the spotlight and uh, we would invite you to be uh, uh, to be witnessing us. And uh, after say 35 minutes or so, um, let me just enter, okay. After about 35 minutes, uh, we will keep the space open for 
all of you to bring your questions in. So during our conversation, if you have any question, please hold on to that and uh, you will be given your, your chance to, to ask that question and we'll go on with that. Um, I already said that even though I'm from Britain, I would position myself as an outsider so that I can be objective and I can be at a distance while asking the question. And then you are welcome to share any videos or any resources while you're responding to the question so that we can understand things deeply. Like basically screen share, you can do that if you want at any point. Okay, with this, um, let me now put both of them on the spotlight. And did that happen? So I think just you're in the spotlight now. Okay. Oh, now we both are. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so friend, my first question to you is like, what is criticism for you? Like, according to you, is it vision, big purpose? And what does it offer to the world? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and also just thank you, Ashish, for uh, like the invitation to talk about this. I'm really excited to do that. Um, I guess I think it's probably easiest to to go from the vision. Um, and I think that in a way, um, what it means to me, it really it really came out of an experience that, that I had uh, in the WeShare community uh, that some of you also maybe know where we were working on this promise that the idea of a sharing economy would actually be able to like really transform society and how we live and work <clears throat> and getting really, really uh, disheartened and sort of, um, yeah, disappointed by uh, what actually happened and, and what ended up being possible. And basically realizing that uh, we weren't actually questioning how is everything that we're doing, how are we organizing ourselves as we are trying to do that change? And so that's what just led to this really strong urge that it seems like we really need to be working on how we organize and thinking about how can we organize in a way that will actually create a more thriving system for all. And all is like a capital all, so not just humans, but uh, all, all living things and uh, yeah, our dear earth. So in a way, like that is the vision uh, to, to change how we organize um, to create a more thriving system for all. And greater than's purpose within that, I think there's sort of a, a, double, a double element to that, which, uh, Basically, it's about supporting and being in service of the, the leaders and the organizations that are that want to drive this change forward. And that can both be uh, like supporting others out there in the world, which is what Greater Than does through through, you know, the services, the projects. That's that's the sort of this external support. But I think uh, a really key purpose for myself had always been how can we, the people who were uh, so passionate about this work, also have a place together to grow and learn and, and build our livelihood. So in a way that that purpose of greater than of being in service, it's both to others in the world that we are, are offering the services to and to ourselves in a way um, who are dedicated to that work. Um, and I think the the heart of what that work really is or the way the way I'm seeing it now is that it's it's really about, understanding what are our values and what is the impact that we want to have in the world and how can we align those with how we organize because most of the time actually they're very much at odds with each other and uh, the the values and the underlying concepts that are embedded in sort of the the standard ways of organizing and being a business uh, seem seem to me to be mostly very much awfully often contradictory or or pulling us away from the world that we're actually trying to create. So it's trying to a bit resolve that contradiction or uh, yeah, create some new possibilities. That's so interesting. Um, I could like when I was actually uh, working in the corporate uh, for a very brief time period, I could actually feel that contradiction with respect to the values and and the services that this particular startup was trying to provide. Yeah, mm -hmm. I would, okay, let's dive deeper and let's see how 
greater than actually ends up doing that. So <laughs> yes. um, let's go a little bit into the history. And I am tempted to go to the very starting point, uh, 2017. What was exactly the context in which you, because you, as a as one of the founding partners, what was exactly the context for you that inspired you to start another organization? Because mm -hmm. as I understand, there was Inspiral, there was We Share. Um, you could have you could have thought of just another initiative, or maybe you could have thought of doing these things through Inspiral or We Share. So why greater than in particular? Mm -hmm. What was the context at that time? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think in a way, uh, it's really important to keep in mind that greater than's origin can't really be disentangled from what we sort of call our like uh, mother mother networks or communities. And I mean, I guess you can't have multiple mothers, but basically uh, there are these very rich networks of relationships that uh, many of us had met through and uh, existed in. So one of them being the WeShare network that I mentioned that was very uh, Europe and Americas focused. And then the Inspiral network, which I joined much later on in my sort of uh, in my life compared to WeShare, um, that was much more focused on uh, New Zealand uh, and like the Asia Pacific region. But I, I always sort of describe them a little bit as cousins because Inspiral and WeShare just, they had a lot of similarities in terms of the underlying values, the visions for society and the inquiries, but then the how they were doing it was quite different. And I think um, this connects quite nicely with what I was saying about like my, my origin of sort of being in between things and trying to translate and see, which is when I first started getting more involved in Inspiral, I was really fascinated by sort of seeing the parallels with WeShare, but also the differences and trying to help share knowledge back and forth between them and, and sort of see what was possible. And so I guess um, in a way, like the, the greater than that, uh, that started is so much a product of my experience, especially in WeShare and the challenges that we bumped up against, the things that I felt like we were trying to do that we just couldn't figure out. Um, and I would say that, yeah, the reason why I got to the conclusion, like, okay, uh, we just need to start something new, is that I guess after several years of trying different pathways to make it work within WeShare, and then also trying to make it work a little bit in Inspiral, but sort of seeing the same problems. Yeah, it was sort of like, nah, I think uh, we need to somehow, the shape has to be more different than what we have as a starting point in, in these communities. And I guess one, one I think, important point that connects with this, this question around business is that especially in WeShare, um, we always were sort of holding this balance between like business and activism. And there was always this funny little anecdote that was always shared, which is like, uh, businessmen call us activists and activists calls us businessmen. And that like everyone always felt a bit alienated often and like not quite, yeah, comfortable with, with those two sides. And so uh, that, that contradiction showed up really strongly in WeShare that there were sort of some people that were like, we're here to build a livelihood and we think we can use business or like do work with other organizations and getting paid for it. We can use that to achieve a mission. And then there were many others that were like, no, no, this is about volunteering. We don't want to get paid very much in that like um, nonprofit paradigm of like not wanting to really... Uh, yeah, uh, receive money and and yeah, just just seeing that as like a side thing, right? And so those those two camps, there was so much friction in those needs, like they were so different those needs. And then there were also you know a lot of uh, painful lessons learned and and many many different elements there, but that just made me feel like okay, I don't think that I can really um, bet my future here in terms of building building my livelihood and and like finding the colleagues that I can really, yeah, create something with that, that we can trust together that will really carry us into, into the future in a very long-term way. Um, and I think part of that is that, you know, these communities are, are very porous and uh, like they, they have a different uh, entry criteria. And I think that was one of the, the core differentiators that like also keeps coming up in greater than as a conversation, which is this, this differentiation between a community and I guess what we're calling a collective or a business or or what have you. But basically um, shifting the middle 
to being we're a bunch of humans that share values and we care for each other. And that's the main reason we're here to saying the main reason we're here is to do work together about the certain theme that we all care about. And then as a result of that, there's all this care and belonging and all of these things that are very community like, but they're not the primary reason we are here. And so it may seem sort of obvious to someone external, but from this history, basically, of that context and, and that being discussed, this is something that uh, keeps coming up as a, as a confusion, I guess. Um, and yeah, has just been really important uh, to, yeah, to, to try to find a different way. So I guess, yeah, we can, we can probably go further into, into some of those design choices. But I think from basically having spent several years in WeShare, uh, working on trying to make a livelihood with this work, starting to figure out, okay, how can we actually support other organizations? And what types of projects can we develop? What is their funding for? Like all of those things. I felt like uh, we had such a good overview of like what was working, what was not, where the challenges were. So at the time it felt like there was a pretty good uh, brief almost for like, okay, if we wanna start over and the, the objective is slightly different, how do we how do we design, yeah, a different starting point basically. And, and that, that really was the, a start. Um, I, I can say more about the actual beginning, but I'm gonna like take a pause first. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Fran. I'm yeah. wondering about the other co-founders, like when you launched on this journey, were you alone? Did you have a few more people along with you? Who were, who were they? Yeah, so I guess there was a couple stages of, of Greater Than's evolution and um, the main, uh, let's say the main trigger for it to really get started was actually around this topic of money that's still really present in Greater Than. And actually that was one of the, the biggest frustrations that I had or that I saw in, the, in, in WeShare that we were just having a really hard time actually uh, working with money collectively. And where I had the sense that in Spiral, there was all these really great practices and, and, and like tools and things being developed. So in a way, one could say, so this was basically a uh, end of 2016. I was sort of searching for like something. What is the what is the thing that we can start with that's concrete to like get this thing going? Um, and you know, I know now that I wasn't very uh, clear with myself about what it is that I actually wanted to do. Like, what was my intention? It was sort of, uh, it was inside of me, but it was not explicit. And uh, it I wasn't even fully aware. But so I was looking for this, this thing to start with and there was CoBudget, right? So CoBudget is this collaborative budgeting tool that had been developed in Inspiral and sort of been passed along to different people. And it was sort of sitting there and in WeShare we'd been using it for years. And I was like one of the most excited evangelists about it. And I had just spent a few weeks uh, with one of the people working on it actually during this uh, five week event that WeShare had organized. And then he sort of told me like, well, I don't want to keep working on this actually. Like I'm, I'm going to go do something else. And I was sort of like horrified. Like, what do you mean? Like who, who's going to do something with co-budget, right? So that felt like this void where I was like, oh my God, like we got to do something with co-budget. So that's basically um, when I sort of put out a, a call in the Inspiral like community channel to see if anyone was interested in, in working on this. And the framing was like, can we turn co-budget into a viable business? That was sort of the, the idea. Um, and that's when Jessie Kate Schlinger popped up. Um, so uh, yeah, she, she works on a bunch of really fascinating stuff about uh, the commons on the moon now. Uh, had, had a okay. background in- um... That's exciting. Yes, yes, very exciting. But so Jessie Kate appeared and uh, her and I basically decided to, to spend a month in New Zealand in, in that January to basically like work on this idea and have conversations with everyone in Inspiral to understand like, where is this at? What could we do? Um, and what's interesting is that we then also presented what we wanted to work on at the Inspiral Summerfest. And I think this this really shows I guess the power of these, these communities and how important also those gatherings can be to then find other people that wanna get involved and that resonate. Because at the Summerfest, we then shared basically, uh, yeah, what we wanted to work on. And then there was someone called Michael Arnoldus who just came up to us afterwards and was like so excited and was like, I wanna work on this. And um, 
So basically he, he got involved pretty, pretty briefly afterwards. And this is also when I met Kate Beecroft, um, who's really important to mention here. Um, and I guess it was more like I, I saw what she was involved in. She was in a, also an Inspiral member and just was really excited about seeing if she wanted to work together on this as well. So that's basically, uh, yeah, when we talked about uh, what was becoming greater than at the time. And early that year, basically, this first team sort of formed um, of, I think, yeah, we were like four or five people. But it was this sort of gradual process. Um, and Jesse Kate ended up leaving quite briefly afterwards. So I think it was a matter of maybe like six months um, because it turned out that we sort of actually had quite different things that we wanted to do with this. And uh, yeah, therefore, I would say it was a little bit bumpy. And uh, again, I think, you know, things happen the way they do and you can't be uh, clear or aware about things if you're not ready to be. But like, I can see in hindsight that I didn't, like I sort of had intentions, but I wasn't really verbalizing them. And so I think it, it wasn't so easy to then meet another potential co-founder and actually have the conversation you need to have. Um, Cause Jesse Kate and I, we, we talked for, you know, a whole month and did a lot of great stuff and we felt super excited and aligned, but then it just became super clear after a few months that actually, uh, yeah, we wanted to do different things. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that sort of answers the question um, because I guess, well, one other thing that's probably important to mention, and I think this is what's interesting also about this idea of evolutionary purpose, of like having a purpose that keeps evolving, but that there's certain like impetuses at the beginning of the things that you really want to work on and just the shape that it takes keeps changing, right? And so in a way at the beginning, we were really actually working on software. Like we had people involved that were doing software development. I, I never had that skill and neither did Kate. Um, but her and I were sort of starting to develop some of the other types of services that, that fit together with the software. And then we suddenly realized that actually the main problem that we were trying to work on, that it wasn't technical at all. And that actually the, the interesting, exciting challenges and the real need was around the human, human accompaniment and support in, in doing these new ways of organizing and in investigating your psychology around money and all those questions. So then sort of naturally all the people that were working on software sort of lost interest because that wasn't like really what was needed. And that's when there was sort of this bigger phase shift where then others, other people started coming in that had much more of this, uh, yeah, consulting profile or people that were facilitators or coaches or org developers. Um, so that's why in a way, if you look back to then, maybe you don't necessarily recognize it compared to now, but uh, from the way I, I see it, it's, it's, it's really the same, trying to do the same things, but just different shapes and different ways to actually looking at that and, and going further and further into really discovering like, what is the thing that, that we can bring here that we can actually offer? Well, that's really interesting. Um, I knew a little bit about CoBudget, uh, but I didn't know that CoBudget actually uh, was such a crucial piece in the journey of Greater Than. And I never heard about Jesse Kate, I guess, or maybe I don't remember. Thank you so much for uh, bringing all of this in. Um, now let's move a little ahead. And uh, before I go into the uh, design features uh, that that you eventually picked up in Greater Than, I actually want to kind of uh, very briefly touch upon, is Greater Than a registered entity? If yes, then what kind of registration do you have? And how is that like what kind of challenges uh, you have to navigate based on GT's uh, unusual organization design or unusual way of doing business, especially when we have, like, especially when our larger legal framework might not be very flexible for doing business in unusual manners. So mm -hmm. a little bit on that. Yeah. Yeah, so I think a really good learning I had also taken from WeShare was to wait to create an entity until you really need it. And so we actually didn't create the greater than legal entity until like mid 2000, I think it was sometime in 2018. Yeah, early 2018, okay. I think. 
Um, because before that it was like, well, there actually was not much money coming in and we got like a little grant from something, but basically we found other ways with freelancing roles and so on to invoice that. And it just, yeah, it wasn't necessary. Um, and we were actually also sometimes using WeShare, um, which was helpful as well to have. But then basically, uh, yeah, you can imagine it wasn't easy to figure out what kind of entity we actually want. Uh, and there was quite a lot of research that went into like looking at all possible countries because our team then already was totally distributed, like every person was in a different place. So both looking at all types of countries, but also entities, like entity types, nonprofits, for profits, social business, etc. cetera. Uh, I actually felt quite uh, opinionated already going in though about what type of uh, entity to create because I had learned about this concept called stewardship ownership, um, thanks to someone called Yuho Makonen, who also was a WeShare connector and had his own startup. And he had talked a lot about this, this concept and he had once presented it at a, at a WeShare summit. And I was like, when I heard him, I was like, I can't wait to do this for my future project. <laughs> like, I mean, it's not the right way around to like choose an entity, but I was just so excited about trying it. Um, so I would say I was pretty in love with the idea that, that we were going to implement this. And so basically what we what we ended up landing on, which I till now feel really happy with, I guess, um, is basically trying to prioritize flexibility above everything. Um, again, because of this evolutionary purpose and just generally knowing that like we're working in a field where there's so much emergence and we don't know exactly what our needs are going to be in the future. So to basically not lock ourselves into something that we then is going to be really expensive and hard to change later. So that excluded a co-op pretty fast because everyone everywhere always tells you that co-ops are very rigid um, and, and difficult. And so we ended up actually uh, deciding to go with the UK as the place to incorporate because they're known to be really, really flexible. And that basically you can write into your constitution whatever you want uh, as, a, as a regular company. And so we ended up basically uh, creating like a, like a cooperative like constitution, um, but on top of a regular company and having what's called like a guardian or a golden share that basically this other foundation called Purpose Foundation has. That means that we can't actually exit. So greater than can't be sold, um, like it owns itself. And um, yeah, basically uh, like it sort of, uh, it anchors the commitment for profit just to be a means to an end, basically. And that actually the, the purpose of entity is, is key. And I mean, it was super uh, lucky that we had a member at the time called Patrick Andrews, who's a, a lawyer in the UK, who like had all this knowledge on this and supported us. And so I think that that also made that decision a lot easier. But I think uh, another piece, maybe, I guess this is sort of like advice, which is that I had thought about languages also. And that, of course, having having the UK, um, you know, having everything in English uh, and, and making sure that everyone else engaged could potentially talk to accountants uh, seemed important. Um, and also technology. So I think one thing that is really present here is like this this mindset of hacking. So like we're hacking the organizational structures that are out there and the entities just to, to work for what we're trying to do. And we're acknowledging that they're never going to perfectly reflect what we're actually trying to be. And it's always sort of this hybrid between not-for-profit and for-profit, and it's, it's just something in between. And, and in WeShow, we had so many discussions about this, and it was always like, yeah, we just have to work with what, what's out there, knowing that it's not going to perfectly reflect. And I think, um, for instance, having had the experience in France that... Uh, there's not very good technology tools out there to manage businesses and knowing that in the UK, they were really good with that also got me quite excited because that's allowed us to, to do things like we have an open books uh, project where basically all of our financials are, are available in a super accessible way within uh, the collective. And all of that kind of stuff is, is thanks again, sort of prioritizing openness and flexibility. Um, and, you know, Sadly, it's also the place where most of the uh, offshore companies are in the UK for that reason, <laughs> funnily. But, um, you know, you just have to have to go with what works. 
I'm sorry if that was longer than you wanted, because I know that, as you can see, I am quite uh, passionate about this very boring topic. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I'm really loving it. Thank you so much. Um, I'm now kind of beginning to get a sense how greater than is actually business unusual. And I want to dive deeper into that. So now let's, okay, before I go there, I really want to thank Nenad for sharing all these resources in the chat. Uh, please do have a look. Uh, uh, most of them are from the handbook that Greater Than has, which is public, and uh, it actually provides a lot of context. So thank you so much, Nenath. Um, okay, going back to my question. So, um, Fran, can you take us through some of the organization design features or principles that make Greater Than a business unusual? Like, what are the ways in which you organize internally? What are the ways in which you talk to each other, you manage uh, like you manage the people, the members or explorers, everybody. Uh, and how is that different from the way it is done in usual businesses? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, I guess obviously there's there's some basic ones that are quite common, I guess, for a lot of organizations out there now, which is of course this idea of having a purpose at the center and uh, the main purpose not being to maximize profit, which of course, yeah, that would say that that's the straightforward one. Um, I think apart from that, uh, so I shared about the stewardship ownership and basically, uh, yeah, profit being seen as a, as a means to an end. Um, and I think also this idea that basically you're only achieving your purpose if you're actually including all stakeholders, uh, in as basically the receivers of what you're doing. And so that includes, as I was saying earlier, also uh, all living beings, the earth, the communities that you're part of, and not just uh, valuing uh, shareholders over, over others, uh, over everything else, basically. Um, another really important, I guess, element that comes up all the time uh, is that we don't have employees. So basically, uh, this is something, again, that like, it's not a principal thing that we would never have employees. Like we would potentially, it might be useful for someone to decide to employ themselves in greater than because it would actually, yeah, be the best solution for, for their uh, admin situation. But what we really don't have is this uh, idea of an employer-employee relationship and the power dynamic of that, because we we do try as best as we can to to walk the talk and be experimenting and implementing all of these principles that we're supporting others with also ourselves. So that of course means, uh, you know, having principles around self-responsibility, self-organizing, um, having, having a governance where we basically can all participate in decisions uh, in, in quite dynamic ways based on, on where people are involved. And so what that actually means is that, so this, the handbook that Nana has been sharing in the chat several times, is that we actually have all these agreements that we've written. And this really, this idea um, we, we took from Inspiral, which is just things that we have agreed and put in writing. And we, we trust that we are going to hold ourselves to each other, but that's not something that contractually, you know, is in any way guaranteed. It's, it's really founded on trust. And so in a way, that's what also gives us all this flexibility and I think uh, for many businesses, it's quite shocking because they would never trust, be able to trust that much. There would be a much higher need uh, to, to control and to actually, yeah, ha ha have a, a much stronger, um, like on paper relationship. Um, and I think that also maybe connects with one of the things that has been, uh, I guess it's, it's a learning edge or a challenge, something we've been really trying to move further into, which is the interdependence. So even if we don't have employees with fixed uh, income, that we're trying to find ways to actually uh, embrace more how interdependent we are and offer mutual support and, and care to each other, also financially. Um, and so it feels like it's sort of trying to move more in the direction of the kind of support structure that maybe an employee would have, but without that and, and from a much more adult to adult uh, perspective, I guess. Um, yeah, I don't want to like go on and on here about <laughs> all of these parts. I'm I wondering think, if I think it was, yeah, yeah. I think this was 
really, really sufficient. Thank you so much. You can catch your breath if you want. I can okay. see like, yeah. <clears throat> Okay. One question that is coming to me is with such unusual internal organizing, what kind of challenges do you face when you engage with businesses out there, particularly the organizations that are structured as business as usual? And maybe you can you can talk about any one particular example of client work in which you were engaging with a business as usual client and then the kind of challenges that that you had to navigate from that engagement hmm. yeah so i guess it feels a little bit like uh, needing to be a chameleon often because it's like you need to mimic enough of an interface for the clients you're working with of being like like them, right? Like ticking the boxes of like, okay, you want a contract. So we sign the contract. You need hourly rates or uh, yeah, you need NDAs, right? Non-disclosure agreements. So there's a lot of boxes that one often needs to tick, not with everybody. And um, I think a key element for us is basically this understanding internally that even though we're ticking these boxes, that does not mean that we're doing it like that ourselves. Um, so for instance, that might mean actually, you know, uh, having to basically list a number of consultants that are going to be working on something and how much they're going to do. Um, and then actually, though, internally, we have our own process, which is actually uh, there's a, a really great process we use for, for distributing our budgets through which we we decide that. And that actually has nothing to do with, may, with, with what is written on paper for the client. So I think, um, yeah, we've sort of we try to embrace that contradiction. Uh, and, and to me, that's a bit of this hacking also. It's like, okay, we do what we need to, but of course, how do you not let that then influence you too much or how can it go in the other direction? Um, just to give an example, so Open Collective is a, an organization that we've done some work with and they're very kindred because um, actually, yeah, some of the people that worked there were from Inspiral. And so with them, we could go into more of an experimental terrain where you're looking more at a partnership dynamic with an organization and you can almost like be transparent about like, what is your real budget for this work? And then also check in more on what actually, what actually feels good and maybe review the amount at the end um, and not having to actually have a, a fixed uh, agreed budget beforehand with, with hours. But that's a quite rare case that you can, can really sort of adapt in that way. And I remember many years ago, we were working with quite a bigger uh, NGO and spending quite a lot of time with the, the woman on their side doing the admin to try to work out like how to somehow tick her box of having this really big spreadsheet with the whole budget and all the areas and everything distributed with the fact that the reality was changing like every day of what we were actually needing to do. And um, I remember it was really hard for her to grasp this idea that like, we're just going to submit something. It's probably going to be wrong tomorrow, but like, that's okay because that that's all we can, we can do. Um, so I think there is sometimes a, a coaching that ends up happening where you're trying to also loosen up their, their approach to this basically. Um, and yeah, try to, try to encourage maybe different ways of thinking about these things when it's usually assumed like, no, no, we have to do it a certain way when it comes to contracting, for instance. Yeah, I can actually, like, for example, about the principle of, principle of emergence, I can imagine how many business as usual organizations might struggle with that. So, uh, so yeah, I, I can quite resonate with you about, about these different challenges. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at the time. We have only one minute left before we open the space for questions. And in this one minute, I feel like going to this question, which is, which is something which I'm very curious about. The question is about developmental edges of greater than, not of the individual, but of the organization as a whole. So what according to you are the developmental edges of greater than as an organization? Basically, what are you struggling with or what are you working on? Okay, in one minute, that's not quite going to work, but I'll try. <laughs> um, so one thing that we've been working on a lot is getting better at dealing with conflict. 
um, maybe dealing isn't even the right word, uh, actually allowing tensions to really come out. And I think especially being uh, so remote, uh, it's very easy for maybe, uh, yeah, tensions, challenges, disagreements to, to go under the surface and to not actually be present. So I think this is something we've already made great strides towards, but it's still a really big learning area for us. And also in navigating this balance of people bringing their whole selves to work, which is also really a, a, a teal principle, but seeing like, where is the balance there of self-responsibility and taking ownership for your own experience? And so how to not uh, like derail the work we're trying to do with us sort of being in our own personal dynamics. Um, and I guess the uh, navel gazing, like we, we are really good at navel gazing. <laughs> um, and uh, that's definitely something that uh, we're trying to work on. So yeah, being too focused on ourselves and, and, and what we're, how we're developing. Um, and I guess one other, uh, just maybe to mention here, that has especially come up in the in the last year because there's been a bit of a, a contraction, um, I think for many people that I've spoken to around this area and in general, around there being less work, there being less uh, projects, business, just yeah, things are, sh are shrinking a little bit, hopefully temporarily. But that really surfacing quite a lot of tensions around how we actually decide who works on projects that had not uh, come up before. And uh, yeah, that's a really, a really thorny, uncomfortable topic, especially I think when, when you're used to having a space where people can sort of uh, volunteer their own energy to say, okay, like sort of putting their hand up for things in a very self-driven way. Um, and I think, yeah, there's a lot for us to sort of discern in terms of what can we learn from traditional business in how this works and what things do we not want and we want to actually change. And I think part of this, uh, which I would name a, a, another like higher level challenge is basically, even though we always say that we know that we're not all the same and that we need to embrace the fact of how different we are and what different qualities we bring and also that we don't all have the same amount of power and influence that in practice, we're still quite bad at that. And I think uh, that this question around how projects get staffed is sort of one element in that that comes out where I think it's hard to want to judge someone else and say, oh, you can work on this or not. And yeah, there's there's so much learning there to do. And it's it's a it's a really hot topic. Yeah, I, I actually know about that. So <clears throat> thank you so much. I'll not go deeper on my own. Now I feel like uh, bringing us back from the spotlight, let me figure out how, how do I do that. I can do it. Just give me a second. Yeah, I managed to do it. Thank you, Nenat. Okay. So um, now let's uh, keep the floor open for the questions. I can al already see one question in the chat. I would like really prefer if, if we can sort of raise our hands if we have questions so that we can have a pipeline of people like sort of a queue and then and then that way we can uh we basically know uh who goes after whom so i would like to invite bridget first maybe uh, maybe you can just read out your question and then friend you can choose to answer it yeah i was curious when you were talking on the theme of mutual support and care and some of the experiments that you're doing with that including financially if you could just ground that in an example and maybe I know that you have many rituals and rhythms and talk about like, what are the ones that particularly support that kind of um, business unusual and care and mutual support? Yeah, great question. So I guess just to name a few things we've been uh, experimenting with. One is that we have a solidarity well is what we're calling it sort of like a, a process and a set of, so there's, there's two stewards basically that receive requests, um, whether that's like for a, um, like a gift or maybe it's a, a, a loan, which has actually um, been coming up quite a lot. And yeah, basically giving access to the, the money that we have in the commons, right? Which is like the money that's in the middle. Um, yeah, in a way that's basically, that's needs-based. So that's that's a very early experiment that we have. And I guess one thing about the the well concept that I think is really great is that it's not money that we've set aside. It's not like sitting there. 
the idea is that it's just uh, we look at the books and what do we have and basically based on the request then the money can just get drawn out if if people agree basically um, another element is that as I mentioned briefly earlier, we have a, a sort of process through which a lot of project teams distribute their budgets. The, there's a lot that's been written about it, the happy money story. And in a way, if you do that uh, in a certain, like with the perspective of solidarity and support, uh, you can really also, uh, yeah, allow money to, to meet people's needs more so, or like it allows sort of ad hoc solidarity, let's say. Um, someone might bring up in a, in a meeting like, hey, right now I just got a really big bill and I'm really stressed about it. And then maybe that team will, will decide to do something. Um, and I guess two other things to name. Uh, one is that there's been a bit of an exploration around something called financial liberation pods, which we've learned about through the uh, not wait nonviolent liberation community. That's what they're called, right? NGL. NGL. Uh, yeah, they have a lot of really great documentation and also support around this. And that's really, it's a very exploratory space. It's just actually starting to talk with a small group of people about, um, yeah, a lot of different uh, topics in relation to finances and relation to privilege. Uh, and it's an interesting space to, to sort of open up, leaning further into that, like uh, trust and interdependence. And lastly, uh, we have spent some time actually trying to surface people's uh, like financial needs, uh, like at different levels. Um, and yeah, I've had like conversations about that in the in the whole group. So we have these open books where you can see like what everyone is making, but we sort of added another layer to understand better, like how far are you from your actual financial needs? Uh, like, yeah, what are your feelings about that? So we're trying to move further into those those conversations. So a lot of it is about actually like getting getting information into the into the group to then see how do we want to act upon that. Next, let's, let's go to Sasha. Hi, Francesca. Thanks for sharing your uh, experience. I'm also in the process of birthing a big idea, and I would love to hear more about how you navigated between imagination and idea and action, and when you know when to stop and start building out what's actually tangible versus still ideating and and sort of yeah that kind of tension between like when do you stop when does the evolution stop or when do you actually start practically building something uh hmm. yeah knowing the difference in that journey hmm. i mean i would say that it's like a sort of an infinity loop that you just keep going through right um and i guess i don't really have much more than like that it's sort of an intuitive thing um that and i think there's really this uh sense and respond approach right so like if you're sort of sensing and you're having ideas and you're feeling the urge like i think now it's time to move into action and you try you might meet resistance and then like oh maybe it wasn't the right moment or maybe suddenly like the energy is gone and so then maybe you'll actually go back and say oh it, it wasn't quite ripe yet we often use this this term of ripeness like when is something just like ready to go um, and I think that the more and more one senses into that, you just know when it's right. Like you feel it. It's like, ah, okay. And then it usually goes really quickly. Like the, the moving into the action is usually quite fast. But I think so much of this is like not being afraid to, to experiment and just jump in. And then based on what comes up, then, then uh, either go back and uh, yeah, maybe wait for the right moment or adjust or keep, keep moving um, into that action. Very helpful, thanks. <laughs> Zarko. Yeah, so my, my question actually is about the uh, the last thing Fran, you mentioned before, before the question started, which is about teaming. And so, um, and I've wondered, I mean, this is for me kind of a constant struggle and a kind of a chicken and an egg type of a situation uh, in, this, in this line of work, because when you have more traditional consulting, it's like, oh, Here's four people's resumes. Then you look at the resumes and like skills A, B, C. But this is the project. Combine combine the four ra random resumes and then here's the team, right? It's very much like almost like analytical. Like you you know you're looking at the key words. Um, in 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 our case, you know first, you know you have skills like facilitation and coaching, right? I mean they're 
many, many people have facilitation skills. Many, many people have coaching skills. So at some point, like you're facilitating whatever it is that you're facilitating, you have you're like, okay, there's these eight people who can all do this, right? Theoretically, right? Mm. I mean, something that's, you know, maybe a little bit more long-term or a little bit nuanced for whatever reason. Um, so at the end of the day, yeah, how, how do you group precisely because you're, you're not going to be like, oh, this person has six years of experience versus this person has three. So let's go with the more experienced one, right? Or like, or whatever, like random um, kind of old paradigm, um, you know, heuristic. And and then the other element is that, and I, I imagine everybody here will probably agree is that um, for, especially when it comes to facilitation or kind of accompanying a group of people to do whatever, like the relationship between the accompany, accompany or the actual relationship is super important. So for example, like if Nanad and Ashish have worked a lot together, right? Like there's a certain fluidity in how they would approach whoever versus like if Nanad and France all of a sudden are on a project and for the first time they've never been, right? Like even regardless of skills and regardless of anything else, like that takes time, right? And so then you have the chicken egg of like, well, if I've never worked with Ashish, you know, it's kind of hard to then start working with Ashish, but then for me to ever be able to work with Ashish, we need to kind of work together at some point, right? And then later on, we'll find out, oh, okay, we can blend in this way, you know, for and then it could be useful in this situation, but maybe not so useful in, in that situation. Mm -hmm. So like, yeah, so how do you, you know, you know, deal, deal, with, deal with this? Well, I think you're laying out the challenge super well. And um, as I said, like, we are totally in that right now. And I think the, the way I'm thinking about this is like, um, I think we're getting better at actually estimating the capacity that we need or whether we have it to say, oh, okay, this is a new working relationship. They're going to need more time. Like, do we have that time? Or how can we make sure that there's the resources available for that to happen? And so to me, this is where like greater, the point of greater than should come in, which is that somehow how can we resource ourselves to have more of that extra space? Because I think if you're just a bunch of independent consultants working together, you're always just going to go with the people that you already have a working relationship with most of the time. To me, the point of greater than is to basically say, okay, if we want to prioritize more people developing working relationships that don't have them yet, how can we actually put our commons resources towards that, for instance, right? And so maybe that's coming up with ways that people can come more in as learner stances or um, you know, having extra funds that we could give to the person who's maybe... Uh, like needing to do more context building or something like that. Um, th this is just a current current question, basically, that uh, that is really present. So I don't know. And because I think in a way right now, what's happening is like the opposite of what you were saying in terms of the team forming. Like it's definitely not analytical. And I think we've realized that people might have the same uh, words for what they do, but I actually think in practice, sometimes it's quite different. And like one facilitator is not like another facilitator. Like we all have different styles. And there's also a question of like, which style is the right fit for this client and which combo is gonna really like have that, that impact. And so, you know, maybe maybe we're also too, too rigorous like in terms of uh, what we expect to be able to deliver. Like uh, I recognize that maybe there's a bit of a perfectionism there, but um, I think we're trying to understand better like how is everyone really actually different and um, move away though from too much of this, like I'm just gonna work with the people that I know and already like. And and cause that's been, it's been a very subjective and then maybe feeling like random experience. I see there's one more question from Nikki. Yeah, real quick one yeah. sort of related. Um, how do you pick clients or do you ever come to a point where you say, we really don't want to work with this client because we feel like they're culturally so unaligned with, with how we want to work and we have to turn them down and sort of how do you make that decision together? Yeah, I definitely think that uh, that can happen. Um, I think that actually we sort of have the opposite problem though, um, because I think because of how we communicate and present ourselves, we probably scare off too many clients through that. Like there's so much of a desire to put a filter <laughs> that like maybe actually there's ones that we're not catching that would be a good fit. Um, I think that it's usually pretty clear before we start working with an organization, if like it's really not going to be an alignment, like we, we wouldn't actually even go into that. But I think um, a common challenge is definitely actually that 
uh, the leaders that hire us or, or yeah, the people that, that want to bring us in, they don't quite know what they're signing up for. Like maybe they've read something, they've maybe done a course. And then once they get a few months in and we get a few months in, we actually realize like, ooh, maybe they're not ready for this. They thought they were ready, but they're not. And so that's something that we've been uh, bumping up against more and more often and wanting to just get better at sensing more quickly, right? And to then be able to really help confront the client also with like, hey, this is really what this is going to be. Like, are you are you in? <laughs> so yeah, uh, you usually can't find that out though until you've actually started working together. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Fran. What an what an amazing conversation this has been. Uh, even though I'm a part of Greater Than, I'm actually feeling quite richer. And uh, I'm feeling that I know Greater Than now a little bit more because of this conversation. So thank you so much uh, for this. Thank you so much, everybody, everyone, for joining us. Um, uh, we have recorded this session, which means that we would be able to share the recording with all of you. And um, uh, you can also spread it around and you can also watch it for yourself again. And lastly, Ninath has shared some upcoming sessions of Jamboree in the chat. Uh, uh, next week is the last week of Jamboree and we have three amazing sessions coming up so you can have a look. And the second link is about GD offers uh, that you might be interested in. These offers are re related to the client work. They are related to the academy courses uh, that we have coming up from September onwards. So please do find time to have a look. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank Bye -bye. you, Ashish, and thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for listening and being part of the conversation. Thank you for sharing.